That what? Oh, Father Francis. Yeah, it does, you know. St. Francis goes together, too. <laughs> Not really well, but it, they bump into each other. Uh, he was no sissy. That's, that's another story. But, but let's pray. Let's look to the Lord and ask his pleasure to be with us. Father, we thank you for today, this morning. We look around in our world and we see times changing, life changing, and yet you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, we ask that this session this morning, this time, looking at your word, looking at how we're to relate to your word, how to be a writer, a scribe for the kingdom. Lord, we, we ask for your attending presence. Speak to us, Lord, and open our hearts in ways that only you could enter and be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, there's, there's something of the presence of the Lord moving. I know in this particular church, but in many places in the world, there's, there's a time, and uh, Jesus talked about their special times when uh, people are judged. A community might even be included in that, but there's a, a, an hour of our visitation. How many are familiar with that, that scripture? Jesus rebuked the, the church in, or the, the Jewish people in uh, Luke because they didn't recognize the hour of their visitation. We need to, it's not church at, 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 as usual. Amen. It's not church. We can't just say, oh, I know how to do that. I know how to be a Christian. I know how to fit in to my circle of people who all are looking for a way to fit into their circle of people. And we're all trapped in little circles of people. But to be able to hear the voice of the Lord say, this is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn to the left or to the right, to hear that inner witness and to, and to calculate our lives and the worth of our lives to one thing, and that's that we would genuinely prove to be followers of Christ. That regardless of what's going on in the world, we have Jesus, and Jesus has us, amen? Amen. How many of you, by a show of hands, have even started a book? Writing. Okay. All right. Um, that's, that's good. That's helpful. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about I'm going to talk about, and if you have questions after my little presentation, we can, we can discuss things between ourselves. But it, if you've had any experience with writing and communicating through the Word, you know, the Scripture talks about being a servant of the Word in, in Luke, the first chapter, I'm pretty sure is where it says that. But to think of ourselves as servants of the word, what is God speaking and how can we serve that? How can we advance what we're, God is working in us? The scripture says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's God working in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So we have to work out what God is working in us. We work it out. We, we have to find the key to this narrow 
path to this door. And, and we need to enter it. And we need to become familiar with the landscape on the inside of that door. Behold, he said, I stand at the door and knock. What's in that room where Jesus calls us, that hidden place? Because that's what we want to, the overflow of that is what we want to uh, obtain is the overflow of God's presence through us. Amen? We want people to catch Jesus as we walk through life and the essence of his presence awakens us that it's not life as usual. There's a narrow path, there's a, a preparation of our hearts and we're in that time now. But as a writer, as with the gift of writing, and it, this could be applied to anyone uh, in any facet of ministry, but we tend to, like I mentioned to someone, uh, they were talking about pressing in and I said, you know, well, one of the enemies that we have to breaking through and becoming what God has called us to be is that we're, we live in a town, a place called uh, Naples. The first three letters is Nap. Everybody yawned. Oh. We've got to shake off that little slumbering thing and say, I deserve to walk with God. I have to keep up with him because he's going somewhere. And our environment can constrain us so that we, we think we've reached the end of what God is saying to us when in fact we're only just beginning. Amen. One of the things I love about, about <coughs> Moses, when the Lord told him he was going <coughs> to go, um, that he wasn't going to go into the promised land. You remember that story? And Moses' argument was, thou hast begun to show your great power and glory. Thou hast to, here's a guy who has seen the judgments of God fall on Egypt. He's seen plagues. He's seen uh, all the chariots and the G Egyptians swept off into the See, he's seen manna show up. He's seen the glory of God, a pillar by night, a flame of fire by day. However, that actually read, I know I misquoted it, but he's seen so many amazing things. And then he says to the Lord, thou hast begun to show me your great glory and your great power. Wherever we are in our journey, we've just begun. Amen. It's very important to, to, while we talk, let me just interrupt and say, it helps me to move to my next point if you say amen to my last point. <laughs> amen. I don't want to have to repeat all of this, and, but I will. Um, but we need to apply ourselves, and we need to be... Aggressive. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven suffered violence. Is he talking about guns and spears? Or No, there's a quality of passion. Paul said uh, that I may know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, that, it, that if, if it were possible, I could ascend into the, the higher walk, the higher level, the higher place where... God is God. So we need to apply ourselves. We need to step into that realm. And I'm going to give you some details about that. But 
You know, when God does something, you look at the universe, you look at the stars, you look at, look at how much was necessary in the mind of God to get this little planet in the right orbit so that the water on the planet didn't freeze, or nor did it boil, because it was just a little too hot. But he set the stars in the sky. He set the moon. He, 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 it was definitely obvious that he had something on his mind. Amen. We look at the planets. I like the word planet. Plan it. We need to plan what's going on, not just hope that it finds us, but we have to have a plan. A plan that, that has been prayed about, and so we have a focus, and we're able to, you know, you can't, somebody once said, you can't steer a parked car. You, get, you need to, we need to be moving in the direction of our destiny. We're not going to casually write a, write a book. All right, there's no real casual, when you're done with the book, or whatever that facet of writing is. Whenever we're done with that, we can exhale. But I know, you know, in learning how to write myself, in applying this myself, it's, it's sometimes I don't want to get up in the middle of the night because I have a revelation. Anybody got an amen for me here? because I don't want to stay here too long on this point, but... Um, so we're not going to casually write a book. We're going we're gonna to apply ourselves. We're going uh, to be diligent. And if we got one chapter or one good point that you start, you're developing your writing skills, and in that development year, you're making progress. But if we can, if we can be faithful to the point of our writing, okay, we're, we're, we're writing, but we need to be faithful to it. We need to be, uh, we need to look like we're servants of the word, servants of what God is saying. We need to have it and put it in a, a booklet. That's what I did. Uh, as a man of God, as a pastor, I had a little church of about 100 people. That's including chickens and uh, a rat that lived in the basement. Yeah. But, uh, but, I, but I would speak a, my Sunday sermon. I'll talk a little more about this. I'd speak it, and then I'd pass that um, message would go to, I had a little team of, of uh, editors and, uh, and they would uh, take the message and edit out, get, get rid of all the stupid jokes that I thought were funny. They were funny right to the point of me deciding to step out and say them and, uh, and I proved they weren't that funny. So they, they scooped out, got rid of, the editors got rid of, of um, things that were not the point, but just fun to think about. And so I, give, I gave uh, them, my editors, two ladies in particular, and, and they uh, would take that message, clean it up, they give it back to me, I'd add a couple of jokes here and there. And, 
And uh, we had a fellow in our church that was a uh, printer. He had a printing press in his basement. Um, it wasn't that sophisticated. This is 1978 or something. But, but it worked. And then he would print up 100 uh, copies of this for our Sunday bulletin. And that Sunday bulletin would, whoever came into church, they got the current bulletin and the week before. And, uh, and so we developed a, a team that could produce once a week a chapter from my Sunday sermon. It had an, a, its own little evolution, you know. It, it, it went from me to the team or to the church to the team each time it got a little cleaner, got a little more to the point, uh, got, uh, and, it, and it went into a file. Now, listen to what this great God did. So now, fast forward, or slow forward, either one. Yeah. Um, here we are now, been in the ministry for 50 or 60 years, something like that. That is such a long time, excuse me while I yawn. <laughs> but anyhow, um, I would... I'm at the kind of the end, kind of at the sunset, the last quarter of my life. And I'm looking at some of the things that I want to attain that I'm, I haven't obtained. All right. How many of you, you know what I'm, you know, there's stuff, there's parts of us that we're going to be that we're not quite yet. And we want to obtain that. We want to make sure our sons and our daughters are prophesying. We want to have, uh, I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave for my kids and my family and my grandkids. A righteous man, the scripture says, has an inheritance for his, uh, for his kids, his children, and his children's children. I want to not think, well, I'm going to die and Uncle Sam's going to have all the money that I had accumulated, both dollars and cents. Um, but I want to leave a legacy, and more than all of that, I want to leave a legacy of the Word and what ways I've been able to help nurture that growth pattern in people's lives. But I'm, I'm sad that I'm not fully doing that. I'm sad because I'm 74 and I'm, I'm not uh, as spry. I'm, I, I, take, I take naps. <laughs> and um, so I, I'm carrying this kind of heaviness in my heart about how, how many years of and you have to do that. You have to take inventory. You have to see what you've obtained in God and how much of that can be improved or, or maybe left for somebody else, or a, another team of people. Are you all following me here? And so, um, my team it's amazing to me. But every week, well, let me back up a moment. My, um, those, uh, here I am, I, I'm in this time, this season of my life. I'm, I'm saying, God, I want more. Is there more for me, for you, to serve you? Can I, what more can I offer to you as, 
was my father and my and uh, but I, it's like I'm I'm sinking. I'm kind of like I didn't have didn't wasn't clear yet what still there was for me to do or provide and um, my dear Lord I op- I'm in my office and there's a black file cabinet in my office and this cabinet from the time we lived in Iowa till uh, we moved to Minnesota, we moved back to Florida, you know, all this time. I'm, I'm, now I'm at the end and I'm struggling a little and, and uh, I look at that file cabinet and I think, my goodness, every time I moved, I brought this with me and I haven't even looked inside of it. I don't even know what it is. I just had a big guy who was helping me move, pick that up and put that in the pickup truck. And, and, uh, and so I'm in this kind of foggy moment. And I, and I just on impulse went over to that file cabinet and I opened it up. And there's a copy of every message that, have I, that have, I have spoken at the church where I'm at. 350 messages. Three, everybody say, wow. <laughs> 350 edited, stacked in, put together by theme, by, I mean, it was like these two ladies, I, they probably asked me what should I do with these messages, but they didn't. They assumed I would want them forever, from 1978. 350, and I had a feeling that Jesus was laughing at me in a good kind of way. Like, look what, look what I got for you, son. You thought it was over. You thought, how do I put my life in order? You thought, but here's what I have for you. It's going to take you about 20 or 30 years to finish going through all of these. It will. It definitely will. But it was like he wouldn't give them to me had I, you know, been really on top. He planned for me to be in this time in my life where I needed to know that he's got this and that he and I together are a majority in any situation. Amen. And so that's what I'm I'm saying is that there's, that's the next phase of our understanding is to be to have a team of people, maybe four or five, that you can be faithful to, be accountable to, where you can uh, just say, Randy, uh, you've been posting on Facebook with, uh, you know, a, a message or something the Lord showed you. Be faithful, develop that. You know, uh, sometimes we can be so uh, detached from the process, but the more we get in, the more it'll grow. And if somebody can hold us accountable, it helps. It helps develop our 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 strength. It helps give us the energy to and uh, to keep us on that narrow path. Am I making sense now? I'm still, we're all together here. So we're, we need that teamwork. I, when the first church I pastored was in Hawaii and um, the uh, 
uh, on my desk, on my desk in the house that we had in Hilo, there was a string of ants. Everybody say ant. Okay. There was a string of ants. They were coming from the left side of my desk, and that's just me impersonating ants, all right, falling. <laughs> so they're coming from the left side in the kitchen. Do you ever have ants in your house? They sure make themselves at home, don't they? Here they are coming up, and they would go right across my eye level, and they would meet with another string of ants coming from my right side across my eye level. And if I just nudged one of the ants out of its place, all the other ants would go crazy almost, looking for, you could even, even hear him, where's Charlie? He was here a minute ago. That had nothing to do with the rapture, did it? The, the, the Bible says consider the ant, you know, and it was painful for me to get rid of them, but we did. <laughs> but my point is, is that we need that teamwork. The, the way the ants need each other and they can sense when someone's not right at that time in their life, they can be open to help us over those bumps or over those challenges. We, have, we are a team, we are a living body. And so, so uh, those two ladies that were my editors, uh, they were faithful. They were faithful to hold me accountable and yeah, on a higher level, they were faithful to the Lord to, to store them and to categorize them. And, to, and, uh, and so to have whatever two or three agrees, there's some things that you need two or three to get it into this world. And, uh, and you need somebody to pat you on the backside to get you to stay with it and to, and to keep your focus. And, well, what did you write last week? Because that still applies this week. And, you know, we need another voice where we need to be objective. Like, my wife is fantastic with finding fault with me. <laughs> Help me, Holy Ghost. My Catholicism is speaking for me. Um, no, she's, she's, a, she's a tremendous editor. She's to the point, and she's, uh, you know, she's gracious, and, uh, and she's really a great person. Um, and she has the ability to, to get to me. If, if I ever need to know what needs to change, I, I actually don't even nearly, really need to go directly to the Lord. I can go, <laughs> I can go around the bend a little bit. And uh, I was in Minnesota, I was um, where we lived previous. I had, um, I go for morning walks. And my walk is also a time, it's a, it's a morning listen. I'm listening as I go up this hill. You don't know what hills are down here, but they're like big bumps in, this, in that road. Anyway, I'd, I'd walk up to the end of the street and then I'd come back down and, and, and on my way up or down, I. I would listen and the Lord would speak and sometimes he spoke things that I know my wife told him and uh, but I I remember one time he said 
I was complaining about something that had to do with running our household, which had to do, of course, with my wife being the runner of the household. And all of a sudden, I heard this voice speak to my heart. He, he said, you know, you're hard to You're hard to live with. Now, my wife has been telling me this for a long time, but I really heard it. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loves the church. This was an important thing, and it, you know, God is not a chatterbox. He doesn't say, oh yeah, you wanna hear this, you wanna hear that. I mean, he gives you one thing to, to just know, and it got, into you, and, uh, and it's grown there, and it's his version of communicating with us in ways that we wouldn't often bring up ourselves. And, and so, number one, we're not going to casually write a book or make a post. We're going to be faithful. Number two, we're going to develop a team, hopefully with others, that are walking the same path with us. Uh, number three, we're going to trust those that are walking at our side to help us to not hold us uh, in the, you know, in our own thoughts, but they'll be able, able to speak into our hearts. And we're going to do all this with a desire to really to please God. You know, Jesus said about the Father that the kingdom of heaven is like a man seeking wealth, a man like, like a businessman, like the kingdom of God is like a, a man seeking good pearls, precious pearls. And just keep that one little thought God isn't just sitting on a throne in heaven. He is seeking something precious from the earth. He's seeking something precious. His pattern for us is Christ, who lives in us, who is working in us both to will and to do. But the reason we exist is because God is seeking something to come forth out of us. David talked about the uh, he talked about how he wouldn't offer to God something that cost him nothing. We, he said, well, I can't take what belongs to another and give it to the Lord. God's looking for something precious. He's looking for how well I can respond to those who hate me, how well I can respond with turning my other cheek, you know, going an extra mile. He's looking for something that when the heavens opened, the Father said, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. I want God to say of Francis that I am pleasing to God. I want to be able to hear the assurance that what he has started, he will also fulfill. Father, 
is a seeking God. He's not just sitting in his throne. He is, but, you know, he's everywhere, so. But what he's looking for is a man who is totally his, a person who can fully yield. And we go from glory to glory. Sometimes we're in the two, you know, from glory to glory, like between glories. Anybody ever been between a glory? I could see it. I remember it. The Father seeks worshipers, those who worship him in spirit and truth. Spirit and truth means they really worship him. It's not just a religious veneer. It's not just a coat of paint. It's something that comes up from our innermost being. And I'm saying this to say that if we can get a hold of that quality of God, of Christ that God is looking to see come up, then we will have stories, we'll have encouragement, we'll have something to say in our writing that will endure into the next age, into that which we have been praying for every time we prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Is this making sense for us here? This uh, Marilyn, one, Marilyn Bryant, she was one of the two editors. And I called her, I hadn't talked to her for several years, maybe 20 years. And uh, I said, um, you may not know, and I told her the story, and she began to cry. She began to weep that her editing was now being acknowledged by me, and but more by God saying to her, well done. good and faithful servant, woman, my friend. He was saying to her, Francis couldn't have made it without you. I love that, <laughs> that all our parts are necessary. All our gifts are, are you know, the. One of the things that is so indicative of the kingdom of heaven is harmony. Harmony, the, the, the sound of different voices blending together in oneness, the sound of healing and the river of life that flows from the innermost being. Harmony, I, I love when two people who know how to sing sing in harmony. There's something, I love when the Olympics, when the Olympics come, however many years it is, and the, all the different nations are in marching in, in sync and in harmony with each other. We're not fighting, we're in peace, we're in, and yet it's not just sitting down with a harp, it's, it's, it's an actual life force that is coming through us and we, we're, we're helping each other and we're loving each other and we're covering each other. And God loves that. And so, this is the substructure. These things that we've been sharing this is the substructure of our success, of having something that God puts his stamp on and helps us how to process our future. So I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you, if you have any questions or thoughts, we can, dialogue here and 
and if there's any any anything that would be of a, of a help that you want to ask, let's go ahead and open it up for questions. Oh, look who's finally here. <laughs> Baseball, baseball team guy. Well, I'll let you keep thinking about it, but let me talk talk to you about um, those times in between glories. Those times of where. Your spiritual walk seems like it's drying up. And, and these things happen. This is part of the territory. He takes us from glory to glory, to new glory, to new power, to new. But he does that at the expense of the old. And so I, I remember um, when I had been part of a church group, and um, they were getting off track, and uh, so they they actually I was a pastor in the group, and they actually um, had just phased out my place in everything that was going on. And it was, it was difficult for me. It was, you know, we lived in Detroit. We had moved from Hawaii to Detroit. And you think God doesn't have a sense of humor. Come on. <laughs> and so my wife and I, we had six kids at the time. We, we were, uh, we finally, we found a house at, since I, I had been removed from ministry. We found, we found a house out in the country, a very old house. This is in Iowa. The wind would come in during the winter. It would come in and it would put ice and frost on the inside, we had a wood-burning stove that uh, we had to put a fan on the backside when the wood burner would uh, uh, get hot enough. I put the fan on and it would blow the heat from the wood burner. It would blow uh, to the, the rest of the house, the dining room and the living room of this particular house. And it was still freezing. It was still unlivable. And I would sit there, there was a, I had a little chair and there was the, the, the heat grate and I'd open that up and I'd put wood in it and then I'd let it burn with the little door opened, and, and I would worship God with my little guitar. But I'd also pray, Lord, what do you want of me? What do you want of me? And I, I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anything. And finally, one day I was, there was a pantry off the kitchen and I finally heard the Lord answer me. Of all those days and all those prayers, Lord, what do you want of me? Finally, I don't know how it is when the Lord speaks to you, but one of the ways all of a sudden, it's like a curtain lifts and something comes up in my heart that he is the source of. 
so, to somebody watching it might look like I'm talking to myself, but I know his tone. And I know when it's him because the world changes. And I'm standing in that pantry and that moment happens. And I said the same prayer I've been praying for three years. Lord, what do you want of me? And now I said it again and now I had his attention. Lord, what do you want of me? And he said, love me where you are at. And I said, Lord, is that all you want? He said, that is all I will ever ask of you. To love him in the circumstances, in the conflict, in the rejection, in the betrayal, in the poverty, in all those things, in the critic, the critic's eye view of my imperfections. Love me where you're at. So you're going to be writing, and you're going to be putting your heart out, and you're going to, and it's the very heart that feels broken, and it's the very heart that injustice has struck, and it's the very heart that seems to shout that you have no future. Look at you. You're, you're kneeling down next to a wood burner stove that you got at a garage sale. There's nothing to you, Francis. You're just an empty vessel. But that's what he wanted. You can't become full unless you first are emptied. And we need that. We need it to not be something that is, that is a, uh, how do I want to say? We need to have a willingness, a participation, like the scripture I quoted a little while ago, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because it's God working in you. It's actually God working in us. It's actually God breaking down the, the self-assurance so that we could have God assurance. There's something that without which we're faking. The smile is fake. The, the joy is fake. We're trying to look like we have it together, but we don't. <laughs> but for other Christians' sake, they, they're playing the same game we are. And if we can find that place where we're, we're at rest, we can find that place where our, our worship endures through the night our praise of God and our thankfulness to God, that that's what he's looking for, all right? So you're, you're going to be a writer. You're going to, you, you are a writer. Start with the positive statement of faith. I'm a writer. I had to do that. I had to, I had to say, I had to start, well, first I'm a human, and then I'm, I have all these issues. No, you're first, you're, you're a worshiper. And when you're a worshiper, whatever you're going through has success because God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And those of me foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he would be the firstborn among many brethren and sisters. It's our destiny. This is Destiny Church. This is Integrity Church. And to be able to 
carry in our heart the, the consciousness that that we are we are a bride to Christ. So, in that substructure, we want to be able to see the image of Christ coming forth in our work, in our cook, cooking, in, in all those natural things that we think are, are, I wish somebody else could do the laundry or somebody else. I'm not saying that because my wife does the laundry. <laughs> Let me give credit to where credit is due. But to be able to come out on the other side of our life and see our real legacy, and it may only be a few people that you ever reach with your writing. Jesus, Jesus got out of the, the big picture for just a moment he got out because Nicodemus had questions and Nicodemus was looking for answers because he was in, in inner turmoil with what was happening and, and you may only have two people or one person that you're going to speak to but you're going to speak with the weightiness of a life that's walked through the fire and was not burned. And you're going to have the authority because when you were attacked in the middle of the night with a dream that shook you to your bones, an evil dream, an evil spirit, you're going to have the knowledge of the blood of Christ, the knowledge of what Jesus did. And it's going to emerge at the core of our being and we're going to be able to say, yes, but... Jesus spent his blood for me and I am paid in full. And then that book, that story, that quote, that comment that you share with others, that has legs. That's, that's something that God will inhabit and make a habit of that inhabitation. Amen. Amen. Well, let's, let's take uh, a little break. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. What do they usually do to like see if your book is marketable? What are they usually looking for? That's a great question. Did you hear what he asked? He, he said, "How can how can we how can I get uh, to a publisher with uh, and see if my book is marketable?" Uh, two things. One, with social media. And uh, all the way publishing is the industry has changed with ebooks and what have you. If you can bring your talent, your skills in in developing video games or whatever, um, your reputation will precede you. Okay, you follow me? The Lord will be there. And I think you might even take a turn or a wag at some kind of video game just to tell you he loves you right there. Um, my, my, my editors, my, uh, my dear uh, in charge at Charisma House, that is a kind of our branch of Christian service. Our, 
and, and they will t take a look at things, especially if I put a recommendation. They, they will consider, they'll consider. Um, the old days where you, pub where you take what you wrote and bring it to a, a publisher, it, it's, it's not quite the same as it used to be. So you just develop it. If you build it, they will come. All right, because these, these people they can they sniff out things that make money in in any of the product. They're not a charity, charitable organization, right? They're Christians. It happens, but um, but that's that's the, probably the most effective way is to just step out, develop it. How far along is the is the project? Pretty far. It, if you play a video game on it, it's gonna, it's not gonna crash. Wonder. Oh, okay, okay, wonderful. Yeah. So, get it, get it where it works. Um, make us a, 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 a smaller introductory preview of what it's going to look like um, and then just put it online and start developing a following just using what you already got developed because they have these investors that are looking you know for something that the, the youth will so if you can create a Christian video uh, storyline um, you'll, you'll do well to stick around on that, okay? All right. Anybody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Pen and ink. She said. question is, how do I do my best writing? Um, that's a good question. I do my, but I would say consistently the best time for me to write is after nine o'clock at night. And depending on how young I am when I answer that question, I'm, I'm, uh, I used to have to, because I, I had a business, my own publishing, um, but the best time for me would be when there's no phones ringing and there's, there's just me and the subject of my, my writing. Um, and I would say uh, to you, whatever is the best time for you. Your, your, the biological makeup is no obstacle. or It's something that God can inhabit and direct you. You obviously have a tenderness toward the Lord. You know when you step out uh, in service to the Lord, um, sometimes people don't understand where you're going, but by the time you get to the, to your your point, your destination, everybody is going, well, that was really good, wasn't it? So uh, for me, though, it was at night, late at night. Are you typing? Yeah, I'm typing. Okay, so you're pretty much on the computer? Yeah. Well, what you were saying with Dragon, was that? I 
wish they'd call it something different. Yeah. If you get, if you are focused on, on a, is it a teaching? Is it a fiction? Good. Uh -huh. Oh, that's interesting. Sure. So write it. And Well, you know, you, right, and which is why you, you want to submit it to an editor who can type, because if it's going to endure, it, it's, you're probably going to be somewhat limited with all you'd like to say, uh, just because it's, it's limited to the, how good you are at writing and communicating. Uh, I think, Joe, you take um, some of the things that you've spoken, someone would take that, write it down for you, present it back to you, and then you would take those and begin to piece it together for what you would want to say in the book, correct? Yeah. yeah. So like you would just re record what you're saying get someone to transpose that over for you onto paper, and then you would begin editing it for what you'd want to say. I think that's what, kind of what you do a lot, right? Yeah, I used to do more, but now it's, yeah, and it's me working with the 350 chapters. I get tired just thinking about it. <laughs> Maybe I'll finish the rest in heaven. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Does that, did you hear what Pastor Greg said? Yeah, okay, good. Who else? Yes. Um, the, the format offered through social media, you know, it's like anything else in this world that during this age, it's, uh, it's got good and bad, you know, Jesus said, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there's no unrighteousness in him. So, if you're seeking the glory of the one who sent you, that presence of God, that rightness of motives, that, that uh, ability to just say naturally in the context of, of something that needs a righteous format, you have that already. If it comes across, uh, or if you have a, a two partners or three partners that you can bounce things back and forth with, um, they, I think they'll be able to be that sounding board, especially if you give them permission, you know, I, I, my, my motto with whoever worked for me was I gave them the complete freedom to say whatever they felt was right. But I would maintain complete freedom to say uh, that's not going to work for this project, but keep it, save it. 
All right, so you need people. Iron sharpens iron. So you need pay people that are committed to you. And in their commitment to you, they're also humble enough to uh, be examined and, and develop your format from that. Does, that. does that help? Oh, good, okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Copyright? She asked, how do we protect the, the quality of your work and the dating of your work, I, I believe, is an automatic uh, guarantee that your property is secure. It was, but you're not necessarily working with a copyright but if you're doing something and it's dated, you, you know, you, most of that you can't go back and take it from some other source. There's always somebody that knows that you plagiar plagiarized. I've got like three or four books that have been quoted without giving reference to where they got or how they got stuff that I wrote. I don't mind. There's a guy that, that um, just to show that I'm sensitive to this, there's a guy that I know, he's well known, but he took a whole half of a book that I wrote that he, <laughs> he just turned around and marketed it like, it, like he must have thought I was dead or something, I don't know. I don't know, but um, but to me, my my attitude is, go ahead, you be a target for a while. I'm I'm just gonna do the best I can. And I think she means like on social media, you're sharing your ideas on social media. How do you protect that so that your idea doesn't? The, well, you, the very fact that you have something that you can date, you can say, this date I published this article. It wasn't a free article. It was my article, though. Okay? So you can prove that, and you can approach the person who wants to take you your material, you can approach that person and say, see, I wrote this back on such and such a date. Yeah, the date will protect you. But you might want to get more information from a legal fee, our legal place online to verify. Yes, sir. All right. Um, when I when I'm on a 
on the Am I uncomfortable? In the worldly sense. Yeah, and may I, may I just, uh, uh, yeah. I can understand what you're saying. When I am most likely to hear the voice of God is when I have come to a place that my flesh is very weak right. and I've turned on my spiritual ears to listen very carefully. And that's more often the voice of God is louder and more clear in those moments mm -hmm. than it may be in the moments where things are just going along day by day. Right. Okay. It gets your attention <laughs> you, with the uncomfortable person. I'm thinking about uh, Paul, you know, in Second uh, uh, Corinthians, where he talks about he had uh, um, he had a demonic attack, a messenger from Satan was sent to, to buffet himself, to buffet him. Did you hear that? I just, all right, I just want to make sure I wasn't the only one because it tends to start like that when, uh, but, um, <laughs> so, uh, so if you listen to that text, though, it's, he talks about he knew a man in Christ, whether in Christ or out of Christ, he didn't know God knew, but this man was caught up to heaven and heard things that's not permitted for a man to hear. And, and, and he says, three times I sought the Lord to have this, the effect of this satanic attack removed. He says, three times I sought the Lord. Three times he couldn't break free, and, and then he didn't break free until, until he realized that God's grace is sufficient, until he realized that, that uh, it, it was producing for him a place of ministry, a place of power. My grace is sufficient to, for my, my power is perfected in weakness. That's, that's powerful. That's not unbelief that he accepts that. It's, it's a springboard to understand how when God moves into a region, God and his servant will be the ones that prosper even if they have to descend into a time of battle, uh, you know. So, but don't dismiss the fact that we also have great peace. We also have a place of comfort. Heaven is my throne, the Lord said. Earth is the footstool for my feet. What house can you build for me? For my hands made all these things, and thus they came into being. But to this one will I look, he says. To him who is humble, who's contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. There's a place where we tremble with our hands, but God's looking for a place where our hearts tremble at the reality of God, that he's with us and he's for us. So, but anyway, that was a good question. Elijah asked, is there any place, how did you say it? Common mistakes. Oh, common mistakes. That's a good question. Um, I think people waiting to be uh, blessed 
instead of just getting started. All right. Uh, he asked, is there a place where we see more people who are writing get, get off track or they need, they need uh, uh, a kick in the rear? Is, is that a biblical position? I'm not sure. But, um, but that whole thing about, you know, the, um, the, uh, the place where uh, we plan, we actually uh, plan. I, I'd like to comment off that by saying I, I never went to college. I didn't have a Bible school that I graduated in. I'm aware that what I've learned, I've learned from life, what I've learned and what I try to share with people is read the footnotes in your Bible because they give a lot of details, a lot of a lot of a, a push that uh, can help people who don't know the ancient Greek. Um, and one of the things I love about Pastor Greg, he uh, he will quote what footnotes justify or, or confirm what he's been studying. And it, and it makes us all kind of look up to him because he's, <laughs> how does he know those things? He reads the footnotes, partly, partly, right? Um, any other uh, questions? Yeah. Well, um, I could, I would say, it's, it's each time, you know, you look at how Jesus healed people. He would, one time he, he spoke to them, go your way, and the person was healed on their way. Another time there was a guy at a pool, and, uh, you know, he healed him there. Another guy he told him, he put his fingers in his, in his ears. Uh, another guy, he spat on the ground. You have to realize, he doesn't do the same thing the same way every time. We want to perfect how we look when we're praying for a miracle. He just does the miracle in some absurd way to minimize the form of it when he's really after the heart of it. So you, you have a, uh, an intuitive, like in, in John 15, he says, and you know the way which I go. Each person can say, there's a way that the Lord speaks to me. How many of you know, it's not going to be the same for everybody. You're going to be true to that voice, true to that. Uh, there's a song called The Voice. I think it's called The Voice. A guy named Dante. It's a fantastic song. Anybody hear that or am I? No. Okay. I just made that up then. <laughs> You know, the voice of God, yeah. Dante, yeah. Okay, let me restart the question here. Dante does a song called The Voice of God. It's, it, 
it is so powerful. It is so good. But that's not all that is to say. There's a way that the Lord has for us, for you, that is personable. It's personal. It's, it's, you know what it is. It makes you stop on your walk and listen. I've never forgotten anything that the Lord has. I may be losing my ability to hear, but I'm not going to let go of my ability to hear, you know. So you know that personable person and your inner man or however it is that he speaks to you. But it has, I, I was just writing out the other day my testimony of how, how I came to Christ. And I thought, it's like I wrote this yesterday. There's something eternal about the word that, that comes right into us, you know, and it's ours. And no man can take it from us because it's God to me. It's God to you. That's the overflow that we want, you know. And you have that. You're like a, a hound dog. You start smelling the footsteps of the, of the Lord who may be ahead of you. But once you get that scent, you're out. You're out for God. Yeah. I'd like to see what you write. I'd love to see the prophetic ministries and the healing ministries be able to interact with each other. You know, it would, it would give a lot of freedom and respect to, uh, to the credibility of a ministry, uh, even if it's a, a word that comes to us in the night, there's something about that word that it's full of life and truth. And amen. Anything, anyone? Holiness, truth. That was the first one. Holiness, truth, and the presence of God. You know, my wife. Oh, that's you said that. My wife, thank you. <laughs> My wife, um, she likes that too. She's not sure I even wrote any other books after that. You have considered maybe doing a small group like a life group. Yeah, yeah. That would be fun. That would be good. It could take longer. It just depends. Yeah. Amen. Holiness, truth, and the presence of God. Yes. Well, thank you, Rob. Appreciate it. Huh. And uh, I saw the doctor 
Yeah. several times like this before I went to the church. Consequently, all of that brought me to the place today where I'm hearing your voice. You are impacting my life. Mm -hmm. You are impacting my life. And the reason you're here is because I'm here. Because these people prayed and they asked God to heal me. And he opened my spiritual ears to show me the direction that he wants me to and I've been told for years, I had a woman that heard my testimonies, various testimonies of my beginning of my walk with Christ. Her name was Frida. She wanted to write a book about me and, and the testimonies that God had done yeah. through me. But she didn't know how to type. She went to school to learn how to type, but she could type to write the testimonies to publish a book. I was beside myself. I had no idea. God was so amazing to me <laughs> just a few months ago. And the fact today, I was at Dr. Wester Summerall's class church. I went to a missionary conference. He had thrown Daisy and um, her husband T.L. Osborne in from Africa. Mm -hmm. He sent a runner into the center of Africa. They came out on the Alpha. He was on the stage of the platform at the old church, Dr. Summerall. And he says, I don't know why I'm come here for a missionary conference, and there was a couple hundred people in the auditorium. Before I knew what was happening, I said, I stood up and I said, you came for me. You came for the anointing that God wants to give me. You came for me. And other people stood up. I don't know if you were there, Pastor, at that particular conference of Dr. Summerall. I was, I thought, what have I done? Spiritual things never go forward. Spiritual things right. never right. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes. How to get through the first draft? Um, what's the theme of your your first draft? It's okay. Excellent. Um, you know, if you, if you can write one chapter a day, no, one chapter a week, yeah, <laughs> smart Alec, you didn't think I'd hear that, did you? Oh, she deliberately knew I would, yeah, um, if you, if you set a, a, a goal for yourself, one chapter a week, and if, and if you will stay true to that, you'll have plenty of chapters. And you know, and sometimes we, we who write get frustrated because we look at the editing that needs to be done and we're not quite sure that we're up to speed on the editing, although we're, what we want to share in the storyline, we, we, can, we can hang on to that. But the, the problem is the editing isn't your job. The editing is the job of an editor. You follow? And a lot of people who are called to write, what happens to them is they get tangled up thinking, I can't write, and it becomes a burden because they're, they're spending too much time, you know, in, in how to develop a story. And just write it, you know, just write it, just do it. Um, the text, what, what publishers do is they'll take what you've written to the degree that they like what you've written and can see that clearly, the point of your story and how it ends and who the good people are that made it happen. You'll be able to help yourself and help... I didn't hear that either. But um, you'll be able to hear... No, that was the last point. You'll be able to get past the, uh, the, the details of the story and get right into the story. They're looking, the, the, the publishers and those that are, are interested in taking the, your book to the next level, they'll, they'll have a certain uh, ability to help you streamline what you want to say if that's a problem, or they'll confirm. And uh, that maybe you don't need, maybe you just are one of those rare people that is both an editor and, uh, 
you know, uh, an artist, you know. So thank you, Annie. That's a good question, though. Yes, ma'am. I wrote um, Holiness, Truth, and the Presence of God. I'm, I'm smiling right now because uh, that same guy that was a, pub, a printer who had the print machine, uh, he, I, I gave him a copy of uh, Holiness, <laughs> Holiness, Truth, and the Presence of God. And he said, well, let's, let's, let's button this, make it into a, a real book. Real for us was it, it, it was not, uh, it, it actually had a cover. That's what a, a real book had. And he would give boxes of books to pastors uh, in Africa. And they would, they would take those initial books and those books came from a class I was doing on holiness, truth, and the presence of God. And um, I, I gave it to him. He put it in a binding, and uh, he took that, that book and put it in a box with a hundred other books and sent it to Africa. Well, a, another friend of mine, a Missionary Alliance pastor, he uh, he was in Africa, and he bumped into the pastor that was the receiver of those uh, 100 books. Okay, so you following this? There's going to be a quiz at the end, so pay attention. So he has, uh, he's talking with this African guy. And the African guy says, brother, have you seen this book? And he's talking about the holiness book. And my friend says, oh yeah, I know the guy that wrote that. And the African fellow says, no, you did not, you did, this was not for you to read this book. It was in the 1900s, and he was saying that because it was looked as primitive as any book would have looked in the 1900s, all right? I mean, it's like they were arguing about what century was, was this book, and uh, it, just, it just always cracks me up when I think about it. how primitive are, uh, I am, you know, to all the technology and things, God, God still can use us, you know. I, I did the three battlegrounds probably, probably three years afterwards. Uh, if I'd have known it was going to be a good, but the timing was amazing. The, the book, um, the book, This Present Darkness had come out, if you remember that particular book, and it, it was a big Frank Peretti, and it, it reached a lot of people, but it, what it really did, besides being an amusing, inform, informative kind of a book, it actually uh, woke up uh, a sense of could it be that what I'm fighting is actually real and uh, something that I need to be more aware? I mean, a lot of questions. So I was asked to speak at a conference in Kansas City. I'm, I, I didn't know anything about what Frank Peretti had written, but now I'm, I'm in this conference and, and the Lord, it's funny because the, the Lord had uh, warned me that I needed to really uh, 
me le level as far as my uh, ability to approach things. I w in other words, I wasn't to expect any special treatment, even though uh, there was going to be a breakthrough. And we get to Kansas City, and uh, and it just coincides with this release of Frank Peretti's book. So on the heels of that comes who? Francis what? Francis Frying Pan? <laughs> you like that, huh? Yeah, Fancy Pants is another one. <laughs> Finger Paint is another one. I answer to anything that's coming in my ear, I can say. All right. No, um, I know somebody asked something, and I'm... Yes, sir, go ahead. Well, you have, you know, again, with our world and the advance of technology, um, you know, we have an advantage over previous generations in that we have the technology, like someone was mentioning here about uh, speaking the uh, you know, the speaking of the, of the words of a book. But it may not be a book yet. You're going to, you're speaking and you're putting down the history of a particular subject or a family thing. Uh, but now you've got something that just kind of grabs your attention and, it's, and you, you could, you know, you could put it on the internet where it would become kind of public domain. Uh, in other words, it's available to whoever wants to download it, but, but there's other ways of getting it out besides that. Um, the main thing is, if you've got to, see, uh, let me figure this, best way to say this. If you've got something that is it's attracting the attention it's online, it's, it's, uh, you have a web page, and it's attracting. The same way you got drawn in, it's drawing in others. And so you're developing a, fo a, fo a following. This is so important because, again, we think we can't get published until we have a finished product. But if you've got something that's grabbing your heart and uh, compelling you toward the end of the book and the story of the book and how it affects you. If you've got that already, you've got what the publishers are looking for. If it grabs you, it'll grab others too. So, uh, so the main thing is, to me, is get it out. Put it online, let it become seen. The, 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 Holiness, truth, and the presence of God. Um, I, you know, it, it was written in a time before the uh, uh, the date that I. Uh, Holiness, truth was the first book, but that I wrote. But it wasn't the first book that I I uh, published. 
professionally published. So it, um, the three battlegrounds is what sold. It, it attracted more people, and that was because of the, the thing that I, I mentioned concerning uh, Frank Peretti and the interest that he generated. I kind of came in. I came in afterwards. He awoke a lot of interest in the spirit realm. But I think I'm, I'm not sure if I'm losing you or you're losing me. But are, are we still together on the same channel? All right. All right. Well, then somebody has to ask something. <laughs> Oh, I have. That was um, within the first three months of being a Christian. Uh, that, that's when uh, that particular book, uh, The Power of One Christ-like Man, I think is the book that, that had that story in it. And, um, but it marked it really was uh, something that marked the direction. Uh, no, they're all being sold over the internet. It's the weekly mailing, yeah. That is the whole chapter is a whole chapter. It's not just a, quotes. And my uh, my the woman who's in charge of our our school, the In Christ Image Training School, um, and uh, my daughter, who is uh, taking over the managing of the uh, ministry. Uh, but that. That came from like two or three months after I was a Christian. We, Denise and I had moved to Hawaii, and in our time in Hawaii, uh, I had this encounter with the Lord, and it had that vision, that dream. But then it also had Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with that. It's arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Darkness covers the earth, and in deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. That's, that was the scripture that was confirming the vision that I had had at night. And then later in that day, um, I asked my wife about it, and uh, I told her I had this dream. I told her I had Isaiah 60. I had never read the Bible before, and so it was all fresh. I said, uh, and I said, and now you, you're part of this dream because I, my last name, Frangipan, means to break bread. And I said, and so uh, it's God wanting to uh, confirm to me that I have a destiny. And, and now that you're married to me, uh, we, we share that. Yeah. And her, and she, she said, uh, you're, you know, this isn't all about you, she said. She, she said, my, her, this is her speaking, 
my maiden name, Piscatelli, means little fishes. So the, so the loaves and the fishes, <clears throat> it was. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Pishka. Pishka. Oh, the vision. I was standing with uh, a group of pe <clears throat> a group of people. I was standing with a group of people who. <clears throat> we each had been baptized in the glory of God. And, it, and the presence of the Lord was coming through our innermost being, just like the scripture says. It was coming through our innermost being, off of our faces and off of our hands. And now, and I was, I, I was stunned by it, of course. I never saw it before. I never read the Bible before. And, and now here I am in this vision and I'm feeling this vision. I'm feeling this, this, this surge of eternal life, light coming through me. And like Jesus said, he who believes in me as the scripture says, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And and again, I read, now I, I picked up my Bible and I opened, and there, there was Isaiah 60, the scripture which said, Arise, shine. So I, I read that to my wife with the hero of the, my story being me, <laughs> that this was, uh, you know, a place of great change. That's why, uh, frankly, I'm, no matter what's happening in the world, pretty much, I'm happy about it, <laughs> you know, because I know that whatever is coming is going to be great. Yeah. And it's, and the darker it's getting, the brighter for those who believe, you know. Well, at least those that were walking with me, with Jesus. Yeah, they were. So, yeah, please. I just write, continually write, just as the Lord speaks, just kind of prophetically. So I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I just start writing whatever the Lord's saying. Um, so, I had just read the email, and um, so just to share, because this is, this involves all of us. Um, I was, I remember, I was right in here in the sanctuary. Our set apart students they pray every morning from nine to ten, and sitting in the sanctuary, September 29th, 2015. God, I know you're speaking. I want to hear. Awaken me. I'm awake and hungry and seeking. Today is the first day of Set Apart 2015. It's our fourth year of Set Apart. Thank you, God, for these students, disciples. They're hungry. They're willing. They're seeking you. And if it's you that we seek, God, it's you that we'll find. Jeremiah 29, 13. What could be more important than knowing God? Our minds tend to justify everything we believe, whether it's true or not. Our goal is true holiness. Depart from self-righteousness and pride. We must travel through the way of humility and truth. The bigger you grow in God, the smaller we become. A holy man is a humble man. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Jesus described himself gentle and lowly. His yoke is easy. Anyone can judge, but who can save? So those are just kind of like thoughts that were just like, that's kind of how I write. But then... The Lord said, Jeremiah, took me back to Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. 
and then I wrote a tent of meeting outside the city or the camp. And I wrote in parentheses, the horse ranch, a place to seek God, his glory. Our minds must be fixed on grace, lest we shrink from him when he commands us that we draw near. What God's truth demands, his grace will supply. And um, just that, you know, as the Lord just showed me, like, this, this tent of meeting outside the city, and it's for his glory, it's for his presence that we'll seek him and he'll find, we'll find him. And as I was reading that, I read this to Greg last night, you know, I, I've kept this in my, in my Bible just because as the Lord, it's so important that we write that all of us just write, write down what the Lord is saying, right? You know, whether it's for, you know, whether you put it in an actual book or whether it's for, for you to be able to remember to go back and say, on this day, I wrote, the Lord spoke this, and I wrote this. And, you know, it was 10 years of us driving up and down Immokalee Road and just declaring over that property, God, that's your property. It will be used for your plan, your purpose, your glory. And, um, but I just felt this connection last night when I read, thank you for, for, you know, sharing, like writing that vision, that dream that the Lord gave you. And it, it just connected me and I, it connected me to those scripture, to the Isaiah 60 and, and how like that, we're going to see, like, we're a part of that. We're going to see that we, we are seeing that. And it's the glory of the Lord just shining through.